All right, indeed, we're glad you're watching Morning Express. We will continue to keep you up to speed with some of those details on the traffic situation around the capital. Sharon Mamani will be bringing us those updates. We'll also be talking to Walter Mangari, who's uh, part of the communications team at the Nairobi County Office, to break it down in terms of what to expect in coming days. But to the topical issues, and it has been, we have been as a country in mourning. Today marks day three and the last day of the three days of national mourning that were declared by President Uhuru Kenyatta. Uh, flags have been flying at half-mast. Prayers continue. And our thoughts and prayers have been here at KT and continue to be with the family and friends and relatives of those who lost their loved ones in that tragic attack uh, happened uh, five days ago, the 2nd of April. 148 people massacred at the Garissa University uh, uh, College campus. And it has been described as the worst or most lethal attack in Kenya's history, at least following the one also uh, in 1998 to so the U.S. Embassy bombing here in Nairobi. Uh, and a lot to discuss. And our person of interest this morning is Ambassador Dr. Monica Juma. She's the P.S. Interior Ministry. Um, and we're glad you could join us this morning because there's quite a lot to cover. Uh, from before the attack, all that has been said during the attack, moments after the attack, but also most importantly, the way forward. Uh, but perhaps to many who may not be very familiar, have seen you on TV perhaps here and there, um, tell us a little about uh, Monica Juma, the person. Thank you, Sophie, and uh, I'm glad to be here uh, to have a chat with Kenyans. My name is Monica Juma, as you have rightly said. I am the Principal Secretary in the Ministry of Interior and coordination of national government. Um, before I came into that docket uh, on 15th of August last year, I served for 15 months as the principal secretary in the Ministry of Defense. Okay. Uh, before that, I served as Kenya's ambassador to the African Union, uh, to a, a based in Addis Ababa. At the same time, I also represented our country to the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, IGAD, uh, Ethiopia and Djibouti. Mm -hmm. uh, previously I served uh, in numerous places. Yeah. Um, I have served uh, uh, in, Afri in um, uh, the Africa Institute of South Africa, which is one of the centers of excellence on yeah. the studies of Africa, uh, based out of Pretoria. I served as a research affiliate of the International Peace Academy in New York. Wow. Um, so I have had uh, a couple of, uh, I served as a lecturer at Moore University. Yeah. So, yes, I've spanned both the public and uh, the civic side of things. Civic side yeah. of things. And we're glad you took the time to join us this morning um, at a time when very many still have so many questions uh, remain unanswered and wondering uh, what the way forward is. So we thank you for joining us today. Mm -hmm. uh, let's begin with before the attack and the question of intelligence that has been raised. I remember my colleague Ian Wafula on the night of the attack asking the CS about whether there had been intelligence on this particular issue, on this particular matter and attack, and he said that um, this is the kind of attack that would surprise any country. That seems to suggest there wasn't intelligence, but perhaps you could set the record straight for us. Well, I think, uh, as the CS said, uh, this is the kind of attack that surprises the world. I think the entire world is shocked, as you have seen in the messages that have come through to us. And I want, before uh, I start also to add my voice to the messages of condolences to the families and friends of the people that got killed in Garissa and, uh, and also to our country. I think we are in shock, all of us. And uh, as the CS says, it is true. This is the kind of attack that shocks everyone. Was there intelligence? Uh, we have been having intelligence not just on Garissa, across this country. And I think repeatedly we have said, as has been illustrated by the president, that the country is faced with an existential threat. So yes, we had intelligence. Yes, we had mapped up vital installations, not just in Garissa, but we have hundreds, hundreds of vital installations across this country that yeah, we are looking at. That you're looking at. Yes. Um, so the British, uh, in reviewing their travel advisory, one of the locations it put out was Garissa. One of the senior officials, uh, as well reported in one of the dailies today, said there was actionable intelligence, and that prior to this attack, they were in fact four more police officers were, were deployed to Garissa. So was the intelligence and the information you had actionable or blanket as it's referred uh, in security <laughs> lingo? I, I think, um, first of all, Sophia, let me just uh, make a little correction. Mm -hmm. It's a small detail, but it's an important detail. Yes. 
that uh, the travel advisory of the British was based from Tiwi to Lamu, very specifically. Okay. Um, indeed, they, they did indicate a range of other places. You know, it was almost like a footnote in which Garissa was one of those, but it was not the only one, if you had read that advisory yes. closely. And in the in engagement with the British on the Friday before this was announced, we deliberately asked whether there had been any threat specifically directed to any British national in the northern part of our coast. Mm -hmm. And the answer was no. They said it was based on the intensified activity in that part of the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether there was anything new, they said there wasn't specifically anything new except our security activities had heightened. Mm -hmm. And yes, we had heightened the security activities because we were approaching uh, uh, festive season. We had done that uh, over Christmas last year. Yeah. And so it was a pattern we were taking because we knew First of all, this was a festive season coming on to us. We knew the rainy seasons were coming. We had the patterns of movement from Somalia, and therefore it was necessary for us to intensify activities. We have had operations on the coast mm -hmm. for nearly a year now. Okay. So were there four officers extra deployed in Garissa? There were, and it wasn't just Garissa. We have uh, extra deployment in very many places which we think are vulnerable. Yeah. Yes. For those who felt that perhaps uh, regions like Mombasa that are seen as economic strongholds got more deployment as opposed to Garissa because then that is why, again, it was targeted, it's seen as a soft target, it did not get enough focus and attention from the security the interior ministry let, let me give you just some perspective mm -hmm. garissa alone has more than 1500 troops on the ground okay. garissa county wajia has upwards of 900 mandera has upwards of 1600 so this looking at it even from a general national deployment perspective it is actually the highest per capita yeah. so the idea that this is a neglected area in terms of security is actually not is correct not correct yeah. so we saw some of those warnings and notices put up at the university of nairobi usiu did you have any specific information in as far as a possible imminent attack on garissa university college there was as you say uh, uh, uh warnings across not not just the universities by the way mm -hmm. and just to put again this in perspective this country has 67 universities. Yes. It has um, 8,000 secondary schools. Right. It has 23,000 primary schools. Mm -hmm. It has 700 tertiary institutions. And that is over and above other strategic installations, whether you're talking about power plants, water plants, you know, name it. Yes. So it is not just about schools, it's about the scale that we are talking about here. And I think this is, this is what, without making any excuses, I think it is important that Kenyans appreciate the scale of what we are dealing with here. And we are not talking about just Garissa or the Northeastern, it's across the country, because these vital installations are across that, the country. Mm. So, uh, and, and the reason why we had four people there is because, just in response, because as I have indicated to you, we were looking at all areas that were possibly, you know, possible targets. Because, mm -hmm. of course, you, they don't say we will be at uh, this place at 5.30 in the morning. We, we, we look at the intelligence, it is analyzed, we look at the possible appetite, we, we are looking at various uh, sleeper cells, we are following people across the country. Mm -hmm. And so I think it is important that Kenyans do uh, understand that this is not not about a particular part of this country. Huh? It is not about, and, and, and the idea that you know there is this region that is more favored, that is more focused on, is really not correct. Mm -hmm. a, and if you remember, even in December, the visibility of the security forces were across the country. It was not really in any one part of the country. Um, yes, there were, the, there were warnings. We know that Nairobi University took, uh, uh, took a number of warnings into their notice boards. We are told, even in Garissa, there were some notice boards. And some students actually thought because it was April full day it mm. could have just been you know one, one of those of jokes those. but um, I think it is important to understand that uh, that uh, that the scale of, of, of the threat 
is spans the entire country, the entire, the entire region, the entire world. Yeah, speaking to some of the students who survived the attack on that fateful day, uh, some of them did indicate that before this particular attack, they had expressed concern about their security to the authorities, to the administration. Were you aware that there were those kind of concerns in this particular university from uh, the students themselves and the fraternity? The entire of this region has been under our watch, and I'm sure you would know why, particularly from December you know and it is not just and, and Garissa was one area where we actually had, 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 had somewhat uh, put under control for a number for a space of time okay. you know we were focusing on Wajia we were focusing on Mandera as you probably would know and, and, and across I can tell you across this country we are receiving information daily from people, they are saying, you know, we've seen this, some of them are saying, and we are following every lead okay. we are following every lead, not every lead takes us to a suspect, not every lead. So I, I want I want Kenyans to, to, to know that we are not taking any piece of information lightly mm. at all. Okay. At all. Let's get to second of April and the country wakes up to this sad news of an attack there and um, it plays out for to be a fifteen hour siege. There's been a lot of criticism in terms of response. Talk to us about when this information got to you and the steps that were taken to arrest this matter. And in your opinion, why it took so long? Well, you know, length of time is quite relative, eh? It is relative. Um, of course, uh, something like this, when it happens, the, the best thing to hope for is that it comes to a close as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And soon as possible can be anything. Because, right. first of all, you do not have the right information about the numbers, of, the, the numbers of attackers. And I want to say, because I've also seen people indicating, you know, how could four people hold peop uh, uh, such a population to uh, uh, ransom for such a long time? Mm -hmm. uh, and I just want to remind Kenyans, when we saw something like this in Norway, it was one man. For one and a half hours, he brought down 69 people. If you are armed, if you take a vantage point, if you go to a soft target, even one person can cause horrific damage. Horrific damage. These people, they went uh, in, at one point, they were on top of the buildings. They were, they were making sure nobody would come closer to where they were. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about a person that has for a long time been scare casing, been preparing, you know, and, and taking the surprise. 5.30, how many people are awake at 5.30 in a mm -hmm. university? Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it could not have been a more softer target, if you think about it. It could not have been a worse time, uh, a worse place you know and so the idea of uh, length of time and, and one day uh, is a long time when people are under duress it is a very long time but I want to assure uh, Kenyans that when we got this information I personally received that phone call at about uh, six o'clock in the morning and and immediately a lot of things happened you know a lot of things happened including uh, the briefing with the cabinet secretary including the decision that he has to get on the ground immediately so that he can be tactically on the ground and, and assess the situation and take the right decisions out there and make sure that everything was being coordinated appropriately and this is what explains why he had to leave for Garissa at that time yeah yeah, so, uh, you know, I have had uh, stories about, you know, why should the CS go and the IG go? Uh, what, better, what better person to be there? I suppose if they hadn't gone, we'd still be asking questions, why didn't they go in the yeah, first place? Because what many are finding difficult to understand, you say, yes, one person could terrorize hundreds of people. But it is the details emerging of the manner in which that the people who finally ended this siege took about one hour to bring it to a close to bring it to an end and that it was 15 or rather seven hours of travel by air by road by the wreck squad the special ops that really took a long time because the forces that were on the ground were unable to handle this situation D so it is in terms of the plans being put out there the availability of transport to get them there on time and the planning that the debrief or briefing took them two hours after they'd taken seven hours to get on location sophia there's a lot of speculation about what happened yes. and you know the other thing about our country and it's a great it's a good nature is that when something like this happens suddenly everybody becomes a security expert mm. it takes a long time to execute an operation like this a long long time because you're you're safeguarding a lot of things you're trying to make sure that you're entering into that building 
is not going to accentuate the crisis inside that building. Mm -hmm. You're not sure how many people you're faced with. You're, and at all the time, when you hear about briefings, people are trying to gather as much information on the location, on the motivation, on the type of guns. On the t it's a lot of work that goes into that kind of situation in Granted. order to make sure yeah. that you do not worsen the situation. Correct. Remember, we are talking about young people not armed, probably never seen a gun, never had a gun shot in their lives, huh? um, confronted in the morning, you know, it is a situation like no other you can imagine. But so let, yeah, let's address the issue of the forces. KDF were on the ground, police officers, National Police Service there as well. They were unable to handle this. Record squad was alerted at 6 a.m. Is it correct that there were challenges to get them from Nairobi to Garissa and that it took a long time? Well, I think, uh, one, different forces do different things. Correct. Okay? I mean, the fact that you're having this and that, I mean, there's, there's many, many issues. That, are, that is why we have different units of the security forces. Mm -hmm. They do different things. There are people that do IEDs. There are people that do rescue operations. They do, you know, it's a whole set of capabilities, yes. so to speak. Mm -hmm. And they do not reside in any one force. That is why at this point we were talking about a multi-agency operation to secure the parameters, to make sure people don't move, to make sure you can rescue people, you can p get people out, to make sure you can combat the people that were in there attacking the students. And there's, there's been a lot of talk about uh, what, what, what was the movement like, which is a logistics thing really. I mean, did you, w w at what point did they move from this point to the other? Now, I don't know that uh, uh, the, the, the IG has spoken to this in terms of the, the way the mobilization takes place because it's an operational detail here and how it took place. It would have been better if they had arrived earlier. They got in there and they, they helped us to, 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 to save more than two-thirds of those students that were holed up in that, in that building. Were there lessons? Of course there were lessons what in lessons? terms of movement. Many lessons. One. That terrorists are not foreigners all the time. That's the first lesson. If the profile of the young man who was an upcoming lawyer is anything to go by, that is a Kenyan child anywhere, anytime. And therefore, in terms of access, in terms of profiling, we are looking at our own children. Okay. It means that uh, terrorism is not about poverty and impoverishment all the time, mm -hmm. because this has been the profile. It has been a profile of youth, unemployed, uneducated, you know, easily swayed. This is not the case. Okay. We have learned, I think it has reaffirmed what we have known, that the involvement of the community is critical because these people are either because they are like us, you know, we are told one of them who was pointing out at the students was a Kenyan, lived, was a work, working there, mm -hmm. was, a, was a worker probably in the university or in the, in the Garissa town. They are, they are one of us. And I think the role, the civic duty of every Kenyan, therefore, is to figure out who is your neighbor. And therefore, the initiatives that inform us in terms such as the Nyumbakumi initiatives are critical if we are going to deal with this situation. And we will get to that in as far as when the lessons to learn and the way forward and who are these people that are terrorizing Kenyans and the uh, changing face of terrorism, if you like, with this uh, profile of the upcoming lawyer. But let's, uh, before we move to uh, those other details, the ministry described this as reasonable time compared uh, to Westgate in terms of response. I'll take you back there because even the CS came out and said this was done well, commended the military, the, the, the officers, men and women that were on the ground. So you will say there are lessons learned, but you will not admit to failures in as far as the systems and getting the special, especially uh, special forces from one end to the other when they are needed. Well, th this is a lesson. Maybe, maybe what we need to do is to have uh, locations of these people closer to certain places. But let me tell you one thing mm -hmm. again, that as I indicated from the beginning, the threat to this country is across the country. And therefore, the stationing of the special forces is done in such a way that you can reach any part of this country, you know? Um, again, uh, 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 and, and this goes to what uh, the, the, the CS was saying, yes, there is a commendation for the officers in terms of the, 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 the reaction time, in terms of when the attack happened, 
did the information go through? Did it go to the right place? You know, in terms, do we mobilize the forces that were within that area mm -hmm. to condone the area, to make sure people got in there, and so forth. And, and you know, we, we are talking this with the background of Westgate, and I think we haven't quite, as a nation, uh, healed from the Westgate. And so, and there's a lot of talk about, you know, systemic yeah. failure and so forth and so forth. I think we have moved from Westgate in terms of a positive improvement on how our forces work together on how we fuse intelligence on how we respond you know but does that mean we have get gotten to the optimal far from it because the nature of the threat is dynamic and so we are going to have to continue improving mm. whether it is in our system so it is in the doctrine whether it is in operation and things like that so yeah. we must continue to improve in responding to the changing character of the threat of the threat and yeah. you did indicate that especially even in garissa many may have said it's one of those sidelined uh, regions but in terms of numbers and security you have many officers in this place we do then why and how do you explain still the numerous attacks that are seen in these regions is it the capabilities is that we have people that are not up to the task uh, Sophia, as, as we, we say, the profile of the terrorist and the thinking, the ideological drive of the terrorist is changing. What does this mean? This means that we have to continuously also improve on our capability in terms of recalibrating that capability. You know, for example, when you're talking about the police force, conventionally, you're talking about uh, training a person who will maintain uh, law and order in an environment where people respect the rule of law mm -hmm. and where they actually allow themselves, for example, to be arrested, you know, to be taken to court. Mm -hmm. You will wait for a warrant. You will do this and this because of a due process. That is not the logic of the terrorists. And so our, in terms even of the police, we, we, we need to begin to, not, not to begin, we have begun to recalibrate those capabilities. Yeah. What do you do with a person who walks into the police station and wants to blow it up? Or who is trapped? How do you arrest that person who is trapped up? So it is the nature of the threat it, that we are faced today that demands that we also recalibrate the capabilities. It's not about... So that is don't something have, that has yet yeah. to happen. It is happening. So we are, we are beginning. Part, part, part of, the, part of the, reci, the, 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 the rapid deployment capabilities are part of the responding to those types of things. The 10, 15 years ago, we did not train and we did not find it necessary to have a rescue team. Mm -hmm. We do now. You know, so it is not like we are waiting for tomorrow. This is one going that on. is based in Nairobi. That is one. It is based in Nairobi, but it can be moved around. But that movement is what has in Garissa case proven to be another huge challenge. Well, and that is an area that can be improved. This is what I'm saying that we are, it is not optimal because this threat is not static. It is not a static threat, okay. it is changing. Mm -hmm. And therefore we must continuously calibrate our capabilities in order to respond to it and be ahead of the curve. And be ahead of the curve. Yeah. To those who have just expressed concern purely off of the CS and the IG make their way to Garissa um, and are there, and you said that perhaps was a good, um, you know, move in as far as just planning out this particular uh, retaliation seeing how everything was going to play out many have said perhaps that should have been uh transport that was used to ensure Rekha got there in time or other uh reinforcements well you know we have many opinions yes. i think i think uh if the cs had sat in nairobi trying to talk to kenyans from nairobi he would have, have been, been quite limited him. even himself so it is good to have had the minister of interior on the scene mm. he sat through it all he was among the first people to go into the scene, okay, in terms of certifying what had happened. He supervised the entire evacuation operation, and I think that's what he's supposed to do as yeah. the Minister of Interior, frankly. Right. The President, after that, said the full force of the law will be brought to bear with even greater intensity than has been the case in previous years. Uh, what did he mean with this? Well, I, I, I don't hold brief for the president. Yes. I think you should ask him that. And we saw but I think the yes. meaning of that is that the, 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 the commitment to ensure that all aspects, all aspects that feed into terrorism are dealt with mm -hmm. firmly and speedily. 
I, I would imagine this is what it means. That it means. Yeah. And um, there were attacks in Somalia, the military reported that camps in Gedo, two of them were destroyed. Is that correct? And is this what the president, in your opinion, was referring to the greater intensity, the full force of the law? That is this a retaliation of the attack in Garissa, those two camps that were attacked? Well, first of all, um, the KDF is part of an Amazon force that mm -hmm. has been uh, engaged in Somalia since 2011. So nothing new here in terms of the operational mandate. But one thing is for sure that these two camps have the, 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 uh, the intelligence we have. They have been key in terms of exporting people into Kenya. And so uh, they would have been part of the target of the Amisom operation. Yeah. yeah. And when the military operation spokesperson, Al-Shabaab, that is, told Reuters that none of their camps were destroyed, that fire jets struck farmland. What do you say to that? Well, I, I well, honestly, uh, Sophia, I cannot uh, be a representative of Al-Shabaab and sitting here. I'm sorry. And, not, and, 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 and the Al-Shabaab propaganda. Not asking you as a representative of them, but <laughs> and, when and, they and, say and that that in actual fact did not happen. I do not think that they would say it happened. It happened. I don't think so. But uh, what we need to know is that uh, the Al-Shabaab propaganda is aimed at, at trying to subdue this nation. We know that as part of the entire global terrorist network, it is aimed at changing our way of life. And, and we know that uh, what they bring to us, as they did in Garissa, is, is, is agony, is pain, is death. So um, I do not think they would be saying, you know, we have been decimated, but we know. We know that the capability of Al-Shabaab has been seriously reduced since the entry of KD. The, 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 the entry of KDF was a game changer in this regard and we continue to put a lot of pressure on them. In fact, it is uh, 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 indicated that it is that pressure that is pushing them to some of the other areas because they are trying to get out, they are trying to hide in the populations and they are trying to move out. So it, clearly we have denigrated their capability and we will continue to do so. You say you have done that and even a number of their key leaders have been killed but they still continue to attack Kenya, some of these huge attacks like the one we last saw. So what is it about us or them that is still, as you continue to be diminish them in terms of their capabilities and what they can do, but look at the fierce manner in which they are able to hit back. Sophia, one of the things that has happened, now we are seeing um, a, an increased appetite of using smaller numbers that are able to conceal themselves within the population. And this takes me back to what I was saying, mm. that we have a duty to ourselves as Kenyans and to this country as a democracy to protect this country. And that means that the call for more vigilance, as the president has, has, has made several yes. times, has got to be prioritized by all of us, mm. all of us. Okay. Yeah. The president's directive to have the 10,000 after this attack um, recruits go back to training has been criticized uh, by some analysts coming out to say, yes, on one hand, desperate times call for desperate measures, perhaps this seen as such a scenario. On the other hand, criticism being that the respect for the rule of law must be the bedrock, surely, for the fight against terrorism. That then when the president disregards that uh, uh, standing order in terms of uh, the define that court order, then this trickles down into even the one corruption. It becomes then a, a precedent that has been set that will ultimately see you undo the gains you may make in this war. This democracy would have to be depend de defended on the plane of security. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what, what this um, underscores, it is the value of uh, expedient processing, particularly when it touches on such a, uh, a central thing as security. You will know that this matter arose nearly a year ago. And uh, you will also know that, in fact, in the evidence that was adduced, that it was not about the entire recruitment place, that actually about 34, 36 recruiting points were the ones which were problematic. Mm -hmm. So one would have expected, and I think it would be very helpful, if the judiciary would have expedited this matter quickly. If we had taken 10,000 people into training last year, by last month we would have had 10,000 extra police officers out there. Okay? Mm -hmm. 
and you cannot under underestimate the impact of 10,000 trained people and so we, we can we, I think it is one thing to talk about uh, to, to talk about uh, rule of law and other things but it is so important to understand that the very essence of the rule of law is actually under threat and the only way you can safeguard it the only way you can guarantee the rule of law you can guarantee democracy is first of all by securing it all you know well, where do you draw that and, line and you, you, you don't have to draw it that's the point where you don't do you have to draw it between I that think moment where then now defying a court order means safeguarding the rule of law. I, I don't think the president has defied a rule of a, a, a court order he has indicated that we should we should have uh, the 10,000 young men and women going into training now if that became a, a huge problem uh, there are also possibilities of doing a fresh recruitment so I mean I think the, the this idea that there is a defying of the of the court process and so forth and there is no reason why the court cannot actually issue the judgment today they have had they have had all the evidence it has been adduced to them you know mm -hmm. and so I think the point about expediency is so critical Sophia that uh, we, we, we and let me tell you every country's every government's first obligation is to safeguard its nation that is the oath that the president took yeah he has a first order duty to safeguard this country however we run that risk of then recruiting police officers whose selection is based on corruption and security in itself has had some of the challenges emanating from corruption so how do you reconcile that yes on one hand this is to for the better and higher good for kenyans but on the other hand still twisting all us back in that issue and challenge you face so if, you, if, if you have looked at the the last security amendment law you will have seen that we have raised quite a bit the threshold in terms of looking at corruption issues relating to security officers actually the 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 penalties the the sanctions that we have placed are quite high but that is why have this process halted in the first place that's why it's in court because of these corruption issues so the law is working in essence those uh, high standards you've set are working and that's why it's in court but then when the president comes and just puts that aside it takes no, no, I'm back saying to even end. for those that are working now in the police force today mm -hmm. the threshold we have placed the threshold quite high because the the issue of corruption is not just an issue of recruitment it's an issue it, it it's a big culture issue it's a big doctrine issue that we are dealing with and by the way it's not just in the police huh it is a big societal issue but since we are dealing with the security sector let me just focus a little bit on the police mm -hmm. and so we have instituted we have we have completely revamped the internal mechanisms on integrity checking out within the police within the ministry and so forth Correct. we have a law that has placed very high sanctions on matters of security officers that do not that fall short of the required integrity levels and this will apply to all including any recruit that comes in the future these ones are the other ones but then the president comes and interferes with a process that is seen to be ensuring that people who may have been selected in a corrupt process do not get into the force let me give you a perspective. Yes, Let please. me give you a perspective. Yes, please. We have the average of about 80,000 police officers. Mm -hmm. And I've just given you, for example, the numbers of educational institutions alone. Mm -hmm. These are not the only vital installations. They count to close to 40,000. So even if we were to take our entire police force and place a police officer in each of those institutions, the maximum we'd get is two per institution. Mm -hmm. But we have not secured anything else. We have not secured parliament. We've not secured our banks. We've not secured our, our uh, electricity installation. We've not secured anything else. This is how tight we are in terms of personnel. Just to give you a perspective. Yeah. Because I think people kind of miss, miss the numbers. And we kind of say, you know, this is not happening and that mm -hmm. is not happening. Mm -hmm. And so the need, and that is why the president made a pledge that he would over the next over the period of his tenure increase the numbers of policemen by 10,000 a year so that we can surge the force that is available to guard this country and this is getting the the pressure on the police and other security forces is growing every day and and that is why because we've just been talking about the changing nature of the threat so numbers are critical and numbers need to be surged and this need to be trained in numbers so I think it is important for Kenyans to know that there is no shortcut because you can't just pick people and say, you know, go guard us. 
you have to train them. Mm. Yeah. So this is the context within which the president is talking to the question of recruitment. It is the reality that we face today. So recruit at any cost because we have a shortage. There is no any cost because the, the, the commitment of the Ministry of Interior and the police to integrity is high, Sophia. Let me tell you, we are committed to make sure that we have a professional force and that, that, that meets the integrity standards and we are going to do anything to achieve that. And we've seen the police face challenges, sometimes even in terms of deployment. I remember it was uh, largely young, new recruits that had been deployed in Baragoy when I was there and different places that also this training comes into question because on one hand we are seeing now the changing face of terror and they're having more professionals. So as you increase these numbers, what assurances are you giving also in as far as what it is training they're undergoing to ensure that it's just not numbers. You don't have Garissa happening. You don't have all these officers there and KDF present, but none can really move on the situation and act on it. Training is a process because it is not going to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. Precisely for the reason you're saying, that we are confronted with a, a, an enemy that is quite uh, uh, robust. Let me put it that for lack of a better word. And so it's a whole set of, of skills that yes. require to be put together, you know, and that's mm -hmm. why we are talking not just of one force, but this whole question about interoperational interoperability of the various security agencies so that you can leverage the different skills yes. sets that are in, in various pockets of the security actors. So one, one of the things that I would just want to assure the country is that because this training is not a one-off, this training is a process we have been thinking about it. We, we know what is required to be done in, in some of these cases, and we are working on it. And we are working, working on it. it. Let's talk about uh, some of what we alluded to earlier. You have political leaders from Northeastern saying that they will furnish the state with the financials, sympathizers, and collaborators that are locals. Uh, the other day, you've had some number of people come out and say this was an attack perpetrated by Kenyan Somalis. Is there truth to this? Do you believe that perhaps these are people, the attackers, that were known to the locals, even the leadership, but did not furnish the security organizations with this information? Well, I don't know what, uh, how much the leadership know or don't know these people, mm -hmm. but I think uh, the statement of the Northeastern leaders yesterday is most welcome. Again, it goes to the heart of the character of the threat we face. And, and within the uh, ideology of... Uh, the, the international jihadist movement, okay. they have uh, 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 indicated a shift in the manner of uh, the persons that they would use for attacks. And for example, there is now a shift uh, towards using the locals, the indigenous people of the various uh, communities that are, that are being targeted for obvious reasons. They are mm -hmm. easy to conceal, they understand the place, they have the language, you know, and so they would not be easy to profile as as outsiders, mm -hmm. you know. And so, and I think this is the basis of it, of, of, of that commitment by the, the Northeastern uh, leaders that uh, they, 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 they will call upon their community to cooperate more closely with the government, to give information. Information is critical, uh, uh, Sophia. On, 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 on Friday, we were already trailing uh, on the basis of information we had gotten, and you probably saw in the newspapers the reporting on Nyali. A lot of that information came from people who were suspicious, who gave information, which was collaborated with the intelligence we were having, and we managed to foil that attack. We have managed, even from the second, we have foiled quite a number of attacks across the country. It's only that we don't stand here and say, you know, today we did this, tomorrow we did that. But a lot of that, we have seen the value of information coming from the people. Yes. Because you are able to tell if somebody, even if it is one of your own, that begins, because there is a behavior pattern. If somebody is going to be building a weapon in their house, they'll try to conceal themselves from the people. They'll try, they'll, sometimes they'll be very antisocial. They'll be buying certain things. You know, so there are some telltale signs which will not necessarily be in the plane of the security area. You know, somebody going in and buying fertilizer mm -hmm. on a rainy season. I mean, there is nothing uh, suspicious about that right. until you see certain other telltales. You know, and so we welcome, I mean, that, that, uh, that commitment from that, the, that leadership. I think it is useful. Mm -hmm. It goes back to the, to the civic duty of the Kenyan, t really, today. And, and, and from the Ministry of Interior, would like to assure the, 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 the people 
across the country that we we, are, we would be most appreciative for any any information that would yeah. help us to 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 turn things around you talk about information and it strikes me it reminds me this details we're getting that this abdullah the one of the attackers who was a lawyer had disappeared from home and his parents are said to have reported uh while back i think two years ago that he'd joined al-shabaab so as on one hand we're getting reassurances and you are urging the Kenyan people, the president as well, to report. But some of this information, like in this particular case of a chief in one of the regions in Mandara, was never acted on. And perhaps this is some of the information that after it was reported would have ensured we don't have perhaps the case of Garissa. So as you urge people to report this and give this information to you, what assurance is it that is going to be acted on in this particular case, Abdullahi? It appears not to have well, I mean, uh, as you probably know already, uh, this young man disappeared. Uh, he resurfaces in Garissa. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now, you're saying that we didn't act on it. Uh, I think Kenyans need to know. There's quite a number of Kenyans that have been to Somalia. Some have returned. We've been profiling some. We've been engaging some of them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it is a whole process. And what we are saying is, of course, this, this chief had reported. And, and one, one of the useful things that would happen, and, and, and we knew, we knew, for example, that he would, uh, uh, several times there were phone calls through, you know. People were trying to follow these phone calls through. And it is possible to conceal. Again, we are coming back to the question of concealing. A young lawyer, okay, Kenyan by any, a Kenyan, by birth, by everything, because this is a Kenyan. It could be any young Kenyan, okay? He speaks the right Swahili dialect, the right English dialect. Mm -hmm. He understands campus life, okay? Yeah. So it is all this level of concealing that makes it much more difficult, even for the security forces to identify these people. And that is why we have more recently been insisting and calling upon people, you know, the community, because it is possible the, 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 the joining of the dot will depend on a lot of information that singularly standing on its own discreetly is not, is not completely uh, uh, risky by itself but yes. once you connect the dot then mm -hmm. it begins to paint a picture of a certain situation so I do not think it is, it is correct to say nothing has been, has been happening, we've been looking at our, at our youth we, 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 we have relative numbers, we are aware we know certain regions that have had larger numbers of youth than mm -hmm. others mm -hmm. we know that uh, radicalization is taking place even in our schools some of them some very s secure spaces yeah because in the beginning we thought radicalization was about uh, uh, mosques and religious places and things like that mm -hmm. it is moving to schools initially we thought it is boys schools it is moving to girls schools girls it schools. is moving to christian schools mm -hmm. so it 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 this morphing, morphing of this thing is what we need to be careful and we, be, we need to be vigilant about yeah. as people yeah. across the society there is no space that is just the only risk, risky space what do you say about Nyumbakumi and how to also just rope in these religious leaders, these local leaders? We've had time and again the county governments asking that security be devolved. But how is it we need to involve the various stakeholders from the county governments to the religious leaders, to individuals, every Kenyan, wherever they are, in as far as Nyumbakumi goes? You will know that the government, the, the national government mandate, the core one, is provision of security and that we have a system that runs from uh, the center of the country all the way to the village level, mm -hmm. yeah? And that is why, whether we are talking about peace committees in Nyumba Kumi, the idea is to fuse all this within the system so that we can feed information into that system and process it all the way up and all the way down. You know, that is the essence of it. Of course, there are some people who are saying, you know, Nyumba Kumi, it is about government watching, it is about everybody watching ev over everybody else because we have a responsibility mm -hmm. uh, as Kenyans uh, and, and we have a responsibility to secure this democracy. I think this is a point that we haven't quite uh, appreciated as a country yes. that we are a young democracy that we sit proximate by the accident of geography, mm -hmm. proximate to Somalia, 
which is still being used by these people to train, to recruit, and to launch attacks. Mm. You know, and, and that in itself places us in a very vulnerable pl place because we have a, a huge border with Somalia. Uh, we have ethnic communities that straddle that line, as yeah. is always the case in many border areas, and that makes increases the level of vulnerability. And that is why the community is so important because we will not be able to have a policeman every inch of the seven. 100 kilometer border with yes, Somalia. Yes. So that is where we all come in. Everyone has a Everyone duty. Has a duty. You talk of Somalia. Let's get to the question of uh, Kenyan's presence, uh, troops in Somalia. Uh, we've had some of the opposition leaders call for their return and other Kenyans um, whose argument basically is if Kenya moved to Somalia to protect Kenyans' lives and our economy and all, now that it seems not to be working in that there are more attacks being perpetrated against Kenyans, why not leave Somalia? Again, perspective, Sophia. Uh, today, there are more terror attacks around the world than there were 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to, to, to contextualize this. When we went into Somalia, you will recall we had spent close to uh, two decades, really, of trying to negotiate to help negotiate a peace process in Somalia. Mm -hmm. You will know that we had been one of the most reluctant nations to get into Somalia because of some of these arguments. And there was a, actually a decision within AGAD that prevented the frontline states, meaning the neighboring states, from engaging in Somalia. And so we took the position as a government that negotiation and mediation would be the right thing. Right. You will know that the transition of federal government was formed in Baghafi. Mm -hmm. It was us who escorted this government into Baidoa, you know. But in spite of all this, mm -hmm. and because we had uh, jihadist networks coming into Somalia, we had foreign fighters from Afghanistan, from Iraq coming, uh, conglomerating in Somalia, and there was a bigger and bigger appetite because the idea was to just attack. You know, the idea was just to expand this ideological uh, 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 frame of a jihadist movement. And that is when we started to have attacks on Kenya. You recall there was a tax not just on tourists because every time we talk about this people say you know it was just tourists mm. first of all we have an obligation to un to protect our our okay. visitors yes. number one but number two there have been a number of attacks of Kenyans themselves mm -hmm. you know in fact we even had had uh, security posts being attacked that time the focus seemed to be on security installations right. and we even had some soldiers that were taken hostage at that time so it is not entirely correct to say that it is after when we went to Somalia that we started getting attacked in fact there was a series of attacks over a period of three and years that, that was building it was this attack that prompted us to move it so now that there seems to be more attacks and, and the al shabab argues because you're in somalia leave and will stop why not leave a person would ask simply that let me tell you these attacks because uh, 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 again perspective these attacks part of the reason why they are so horrific is the scale of the attacks mm -hmm. okay we've managed to contain quite a bit of these attacks but when they happen like they did on second we talk about 147 people you know when they attack for example in the quarry you're talking about tens of kenyans mm -hmm. dying at once and this is what is so horrifying about it it's about the scale of these attacks first of all that is what is so when you talk about how many attacks happened you know th there are few but the numbers of victims is quite large yeah. so i think it, it is important to have that perspective that even if you are not in somalia and this is what i want to tell kenyans First of all, it means that you would provide the training grounds because the Somali government is still not having the capability to govern effectively, particularly the areas where these people have been holding forth. Mm -hmm. So it means that we would open those areas for their comeback. It means you would give them training grounds. It means you would strengthen them. And, and the problem now with a situation like Yemeni, it would not be very difficult for them to access weapons. So it would not necessarily make us any safer it will probably make us much, much 
unsafe you know okay. and i think this is what people need to understand of course we also have the international obligation in terms of securing somalia because more than any other country we probably stand our own stability is inextricably linked to that of somalia so if is somalia is not safe yeah if somalia is not safe i can tell anybody anytime and you can take this to the bank this country will not be safe so is there an exit plan or is kenya going to be in somalia indefinitely kenya is not has no appetite and i'm not speaking uh, you know uh, uh, for for the the ministry of defense but kenya has no appetite to be in somalia forever and we have argued as i did even when i was in the au because that's when we went to somalia i happened to be uh, the, the ambassador then at the african union when we were getting incorporated into somalia we actually as a matter of fact quite hesitated and we were called upon including by the united nations secretary Sec security council to engage and when we did everybody agreed to the point of taking of kismai which was a big big supply line for al shabaab and that was the beginning of their collapse this is the beginning of dis dismantling their networks mm -hmm. um so there is no appetite to stay in uh, in somalia but until it, infinitum speak, it's unclear well, as we speak, we are part of AMISOM and will continue to be part of AMISOM. Okay. There is within the African Union a plan, because as you probably know, Somalia is going to be having their elections in 2016. Mm -hmm. We are hoping that the regional administrations are going to strengthen their governance mm -hmm. for the backfill. The important thing is to have a backfill. The, 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 in sector two, where KDF is operating, we have taken almost 20 towns from the point of our border all the way to Kismayu. Right. And so it is important that there is, a, there is a backfill. Otherwise, we move out and we create a vacuum, a vacuum. that they will take over. Our time is up. We have about two minutes before we wind up. But a quick one on refugees camps being closed and that being a proposal being put out by the Northeastern leaders saying that the camps have been an intelligence provide so centers for training and coordination and assembly of terror networks. There is no refugee camp that is made to be in perpetuity. And therefore the return of refugees is a normal practice. We believe as Somalia uh, uh, restores order, and as I've indicated, there are large swaths of areas in Somalia that have been liberated. We believe that Somalians should go back home mm -hmm. because it's the right thing to happen. They have to be part of the political process in that country, mm -hmm. even as part of stabilization of that country. Yeah. And it is within that framework that we have supported the repatriation. Secondly, we think they should return because the camps have critically changed their humanitarian character. We are having camps that are now sections of them operating like logistics based for terror attacks, planning bases, and we think it has a direct implication for our security and therefore hence the, this call for the closure of the camps. Of oh, the camps. Yeah. Uh, I'll ask you this because Kindiki, the um, Senate Majority Leader, says uh, he's proposing an establishment of an independent homeland security unit uh, and his argument is that this will ensure Kenyans at home as uh, so of course we engage internationally in those obligations you described and talked about earlier that they are safe and there's more directed um, effort towards the homeland well you know th this is uh, almost a, a nomenclature thing it's mm -hmm. about language uh, interior homeland, homeland it's the same. the same it's one and the same but the evaluation of even the homeland security from from america yes. where it is driven from is indicative that creating a unit which you are calling a, a discrete unit for homeland security is not the answer the answer lies in leveraging all your capabilities and so in creating ways of interagency cooperation and reaction when okay. there is need all right and finally what you tell kenyans now third day of mourning um having lost 148 and um it's sad it's heartbreaking it's heart-wrenching it's the tales you get to hear what families are going through unimaginable stuff and as far as where and what measures you plan to put of course you cannot give a strategy uh, but what plans what you intend to do as government and as ministry to ensure that kenyans again no matter where they are are safe first of all in the next few days kenyans are going to be burying their loved ones across the country mm. And we want to call on everyone, even as we mourn, even as we heart, to remember that this is a one indivisible nation, that uh, it is in unity that we are going to be able to confront the threat before us, and that we cannot 
begin to point fingers at one another because that would be playing directly into the into the aspirations of the al Shabaab. Yeah. And therefore we just call upon every Kenyan as we heart, as we mourn, to remember that this country will stand if we stand together. Right. Secondly, that um, within the security sector, in particular in interior, we are already uh, we are reviewing uh, that operation. We are looking at it very closely in terms of what could be improved if something like this happened in the future. Now, and we are doing everything, everything that we can within our re limited resources to ensure that we protect this country. Number three, and I think this is very important, we call upon every Kenyan to take seriously their civic duty. They have to be the eyes of one another. We have to be each other's keeper. Anything you see, even when it seems innocent, please let somebody know. Mm. You know, it is better to err on the side of caution than to be sorry. Because I am sure if uh, we had gotten certain information about people who were in, and that is why, Sophia, we were insisting, yeah. even in the amendment, in the, in the proposal for the amendment, we wanted to have recording of everybody that stays in every hotel, small or big. Mm -hmm. We do this for big hotels, we should this, do this for small, small hotels. Hotel. Because increasingly we are seeing an appetite to use those small hotels because they are the ones where we do not have records yeah. of. So it is important that every information is, is, is brought through to us. Okay. Finally, yes. finally, that we are part of the international community and we are in Somalia because in securing Somalia, we secure Kenya in the long run. All right, and we'll end it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sophia. Ambassador you. Dr. Monica Juma, who's the Principal Secretary, Ministry of Interior and Coordination of National Government with us this morning on Person of Interest and addressing many of those questions that have been raised, most of those concerns, the way forward, what is likely to happen. You've had it from her and we thank her for being with us for the Person of Interest. Stay with us because Morning Express continues shortly. In the next hour, we'll have your health and this morning we focus on antenatal care. We'll also continue giving you updates on the traffic nightmare that uh, this removal of roundabouts uh, is going to be meaning for you, especially those uh, watching us in Nairobi. Sean Momani will be giving us updates. She's live on one of the roundabouts. It's been crazy. I'm sure you've seen some of that. So stay with us right here on KTN.